a few of us, so you may take me serious. Well, that's what I was having some idea. Okay, so you got our own 1984. Oh. Hey, Nat, want to play flag football? Hmm. I'm not sure. I kind of wanted to play tackle football today. Play tackle football today. Okay, sounds good to me. Let me go get my pads and some friends, and I'll be right back. Okay, cool. See you then. Hey, dude, I'm back, and I brought some of my buddies. Are you ready to do this? Yeah, I am. Do you want to be on defense or offense first? I'll take defense. Okay, cool. One of my friends, Jaden, is going to be the quarterback. Okay, and Zach will be my quarterback. What happened to you? I was running with the ball, and our heads collided while I was playing football. Okay, what hurts? Just my head. It's pounding. Okay, we're going to take you for an MRI. The results are back, and you have a concussion caused by the head-on hit that occurred during the football game. Cut. 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 You're done. These head-on hits have been happening for decades now, all the way from Little Pee Wee football to the NFL. Although they still have been happening for decades, in recent years, these hits have been becoming more and more deadly. So coach, how have concussions affected softball specifically here at BGSU? Um, specifically, I would say we probably have about two or three athletes each year that suffers concussions. There's a lot of possible ways to get concussions while playing softball. For instance, we have diving into bases, we have getting hit by balls, we have taking a ground ball to the face, um, taking a throw to the face, and then immediately we get them into the training room tested for concussions. I found that even to us, two to three players a year seems like a lot. But over the last couple of years, I've been paying more attention to other sports. Like baseball, they have about four or five just because they're boys and they're, you know. Anyway, and then hockey has quite a few. And then football, I found, has the most concussions each year and at BGSU specifically because of how head-on the sport is and how contact it is. Warm up the muscles to avoid any injury that can be sustained during that physical activity. Lack of stretching. And they... Um, are, I think I talked to the football coach and he said they have about 15 to 16 concussions each year. They have 112 football players. So majority of the football players are getting hit and getting concussions and it's not safe at all because I mean concussions can cause brain damage, cause so many problems throughout their life actually. So concussions with softball, we're not really stressed about it, but when it comes to the other sports at BGSU, the hockey, football specifically, we focus more on trying to protect them and what they're doing so that concussions can stop and not happen anymore because it's not safe at all. Brain damage is not okay. All right. You know, basketball. And... Okay, so, Coach, on, while we're on the top of NFL, how do you feel about the new rule that uh, says that if any player hit head-to-head, -head, it creates a 15-yard penalty? Um, I could actually agree with that. I wouldn't agree with the penalty. I just think, like, I wouldn't agree with the 15-yard penalty because, I mean, I understand there are other rules. You can't rough passers. You can't do all of this stuff. But when it comes to the head-on collisions, I feel like that's more serious. I wouldn't say they need to be ejected from the game. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to WTBU News, the beat of Boston I University. I'm Ethan Levitt, here to bring you the Sports 7 at 7. So coming in at number one, the, the New England Patriots suffered their first loss of the season this Sunday, falling to the Cincinnati Bengals 13-6 to in Cincy. Tom Brady struggled mightily against the surprising Bengals pass rush, going 18 for 38 with an interception in the final seconds of the fourth quarter, ending his streak of 52 consecutive games with a touchdown pass. Intercepted inside the five.
The ball got bounced, popped up into the air. Adam Jones has it. It's up in the air and flat on his back. He keeps it off the ground. The only touchdown of the game was a rushing touchdown by former New England Patriot Ben Jarvis Green Ellis in the fourth quarter that was the go-ahead touchdown. Um, at coming in at number two, the Los Angeles Dodgers became the first team to move on to the next round of the Major League Baseball playoffs, defeating the Atlanta Braves 4-3 to in Game 4 of the National League Division Series to take the series three games to one. The Dodgers bashed three home runs on the night, including two from former Red Sox outfielder Carl Crawford and the go-ahead two-run two home run by Juan Uribe in the bottom of the eighth inning. Unlike the Dodgers, the Boston Red Sox will have to wait at least one more game before celebrating as they lost to the Tampa Bay Rays 5-4 to in Game 3 of the American League Division Series. The Rays erased a 3-0 deficit before catcher Jose Lobaton hit a walk-off home run off closer Koji Uihara in the bottom of the ninth inning. At number 4, the Denver Broncos have tied an NFL record for the largest opening spread. Thanks to a dominating and record-setting 5-0 start, the Denver Broncos are favored to win by 28 points over the 0-5 Jacksonville Jaguars in Week 6. According to the Gold Sheet, a sports betting publication that has been tracking point spreads since the 1950s, that number ties the highest spread of all time, set by the Baltimore Colts over the expansion Atlanta Falcons in 1966. The Falcons did cover that spread, though. Just to point out the drastic difference in the performance of the Broncos and the Jaguars this season, the Broncos' 51 points against the Dallas Cowboys on Sunday is equal to the total number of points the Jaguars have scored all season thus far. At number 5, the Atlanta Falcons are concerned that Pro Bowl wide receiver Julio Jones could be out for the remainder of the season after suffering a foot injury during the team's Monday night loss to the New York J-E-T-S Jets Jets Jets. X-rays taken after the game were clean, but Jones had a CT scan Tuesday morning that might have indicated a more serious injury. He will seek a second opinion from noted foot specialist Dr. Robert Anderson. Losing Jones would be a significant blow for a Falcons team that has already been hit hard by injuries this season. Um, Atlanta has not had running back Steven Jackson since he suffered a hamstring injury in Week 2, and receiver Roddy White, who has battled a high ankle sprain all season thus far, was knocked out of Monday night's game as well with a hamstring injury. Jones currently leads the NFL with 41 receptions. At number 6, sticking with football, Former Tampa Bay Buccaneers quarterback Josh Freeman is signing with the Minnesota Vikings. The Vikings gave Freeman a one-year deal worth about $3 million. All totaled, Freeman will make more than $11.4 million this season until he becomes a free agent this winter, factoring in the $2.479 million the Buccaneers paid him at the start of this season and $5.9 million in termination pay from the team, plus his deal with Minnesota. I don't think that there's a quarterback in that in the game of football that that doesn't think that uh, they'd be a good fit for this offense, and I, I say that from standpoint of uh, you know the talent that is on this offense. I like to stay in the moment, regardless of the situation, and uh, you know right now uh, it's all about all about Minnesota, all about what I can do, uh, regardless of the role, to make this team a better football team. Freeman also has been linked to the Buffalo Bills and the Oakland Raiders since being released by the Buccaneers on Thursday after a tumultuous season for the quarterback and the team that made him the 17th overall pick in the 2009 NFL Draft. Freeman was benched in favor of Mike Glennon before Tampa Bay's 13-10 loss to Arizona in Week 4. The Vikings add Freeman to a quarterbacking depth chart that already includes Christian Ponder and former Patriot Matt Castle, who started in place of the injured Ponder in Minnesota's only win of the season. At number 7, it did not take long for the first NHL coaching casualty. After an 0-3 start, the Philadelphia Flyers fired coach Peter Laviolette on Monday, three seasons after he led them to the Stanley Cup Finals. Assistant Craig Berube, in his seventh season coaching within the organization, was promoted to replace Laviolette. Laviolette's firing is the earliest to start an NHL season since the 1971-72 campaign. And, you know, in watching that team play both late last season and in the opening three games this year, there's a total disconnect, you know, even from the outside looking in, in terms of the way the players were going about their 
jobs and, and you know the frustration obviously from here at Labillette and you know the word from the dressing room on the inside is that really Labillette and the players were not on the same page and that was pretty obvious. Finally at number eight the Boston University men's ice hockey team came away with a two to one victory over St. Francis Xavier in an exhibition matchup on Saturday to kick off the David Quinn era behind the bench after 40 years with Jack Parker. Freshman Nick Roberto and Tommy Kelly scored the goals for the Terriers with the game winner coming from Kelly at 17.07 of the third period. The Terriers will take on UMass Amherst on Friday night at 7.30 p.m. at Aganis Arena. Just a shameless plug, I will also have the call for for the game, so just an extra incentive for you to tune in. Uh, so that was Ethan Levitt with your Sports 7 at 7, and we'll be back with entertainment right after the break. This is WTVU News, the beat of Boston University. <laughs> 